How cool. Welcome to our 7 p.m. session of the March 20th, 2018 Public Safety Study Session. I'd like to ask the clerk at this time to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member, it's Crone. Present. Matthews. Here. Chase. Here. Brown. Here. Noroyan. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Terrazas. Here. Tonight we only have one item on our agenda, which will be the public safety study session. And this was one, the last time we had a comprehensive study session was about, I'd say it's been about four years ago. And so I'm really thankful for all those of you that are present. Um, we'll have a staff presentation followed by questions from the council and we'll have then the opportunity for public comment and deliberation. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to um, Police Chief Andy Mills to kick off the meeting. Well, good evening. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, go through these 250 slides with me. Um, actually, it's only 40 Wait, some, like, so what? <laughs> we want to make you feel better about how long this is going to last. Uh, this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to show you and discuss with you what direction we're headed, what uh, challenges we see and uh, how do we get to uh, the end game. And so we'll, we'll go through this, this, these uh, slides with you. I would like to acknowledge that several of my senior staff members are here and, uh, and acknowledge uh, them for their hard work. So we have Deputy Chief Martinez and Deputy Chief Filippo with us. Uh, just can't say enough good things about the quality of work that they've been doing and helping with this whole process. And we also have uh, uh, three of our four lieutenants. One lieutenant is currently at a, a meeting down in Los Angeles. Uh, but uh, we have uh, Lieutenant um, Jose Garcia. Um, might help if I move my glasses. Lieutenant Warren Berry. <laughs> and, uh, and then Lieutenant Christian Lamas, and as well several other staff members uh, who have come to, uh, to take part in this. So uh, as you're aware, <laughs> as you're aware, uh, we'll staffing staff. Yeah, you got one more there. Hey, Arnold. <laughs> well, that's what teach him to sit down. Uh, uh, and then uh, Lieutenant Arnold Vasquez, uh, our newest lieutenant, and just doing a marvelous job also. So as you're aware, uh, in 2016, there was discussion amongst city council about a staffing study and what that might be able to do uh, for the city in terms of understanding the problems and the difficulties with uh, crime and disorder in our city. And, uh, and prior to my arrival, um, a contract was agreed to with uh, CPSM to conduct this analysis, and uh, they did so, and uh, that was completed in November of 2017. Uh, just so you understand who they are, it's an experienced group of, uh, and team of former command staff members, one uh, former city manager and one former city uh, chief of police, as well as technical advisors to come in and really scour a police department from top to bottom and uh, really take a good look at who we are, what we're doing. Uh, literally, they uh, left no stone unturned. So the Center for Public Safety Management uh, came in and uh, uh, under the auspices, the umbrella of the International City and County Management Association and, uh, and took a look at us and interviewed most of our staff and, uh, and did a, a good thorough job. And as a result, they were, uh, gave us a a, some feedback that I'll go over in a, in a few minutes. Uh, just the background of the staffing study, if I might. So it was an analysis of the operational efficiencies of our department and the configurations that might improve uh, officer availability and productivity. And I think that's the key element that we're trying to drive at is our effectiveness. And there were three phases of the study. The data collection occurred first, and they did a great job uh, pouring over that data. And then, uh, and then they did a site visit and then construction of the recommendations, which you see in front of you. Uh, there's 103 recommendations uh, to both the uh, SCPD and Parks and Rec. Of those, uh, there are 13 categories for police and seven different categories uh, for Rangers. And we'll, again, get into all of this. And the full report is posted online uh, for anybody uh, from the community to see as well. 
Uh, the executive summary uh, states that, uh, uh, and congratulations to SCPD, uh, overall they've provided very high quality of law enforcement service to the city of Santa Cruz. And I think that's something to take a look at and appreciate and understand how hard the men and women of this department work on a daily basis, as well as the parks and rec staff. Uh, staffing, the staff is professional and dedicated. They're, well, uh, they're well, also well educated. Um, the analysis was conducted to understand our strengths, but also the opportunities that we have to make it better. And uh, so we want to take a good hard look at that. And then uh, one thing that jumped out at me immediately was uh, that uh, many of the recommendations can be accomplished by realigning our workload. And when you take a look at that, uh, I think that one phrase sums up much of this, uh, this investment that we, that we did. And then uh, also, and I'm quoting here, recognize that this process takes time, uh, not just weeks or months, but perhaps years. And I think that uh, that's an important caution. So the police department had 80 recommendations. I am have to report that we've jumped on it with both feet and uh, 37 are done. Of the, and then there's another 20 that are currently underway and then 23 that we are gonna have to take a little bit longer look at, study and figure out whether or not we can do those in terms of cost and, and effort and time. But uh, many of these, again, will take time, uh, a long period of time to implement. Parks and Recs had 23 recommendations most of those centered around or were solved by movement to uh, SCPD. And uh, again, we'll get into that. So of the uh, recommendations by assignment, uh, 13 primary categories comprising uh, the age recommendations, administrative uh, recommendations for the chief's office, two are done, one is underway. And uh, you can go into the uh, front part of the uh, report and see what each of these individual recommendations are. Patrol, there are three done, uh, one underway, and we're gonna have to study one, and then downtown unit, uh, one is done. And net team, two are done. Uh, now, having said that, the downtown unit and the net team no longer exist. That's why they're done. Uh, they've now been merged into the neighborhood policing teams, and, uh, and that's uh, a, a significant movement for us. Um, I can go through all these individually and report out, you know, two done, one done, but I think that you can read these for yourself. The point is, uh, that we've really taken this seriously. Uh, we've worked very hard to implement some of these recommendations and, uh, and took uh, great care to study them. And uh, again, you can see that there's some for the facilities, some for uh, transportation and booking. There's a variety of, of, of things that are recommendations they made. Some, to be frank, won't just work here, um, but we're gonna look at them anyway and make sure that we study them to understand uh, whether or not these would work and, and what reasons they may not work. Timeline for Im implementation. Uh, we're, in, imp we're committed to implement the, implementing these as fast as possible, as long as they're operationally and fiscal, fiscally reasonable. Um, a five-year time frame is what they suggested is to have most of these done, which fits nicely with our leadership plan that we've already completed. And so we were happy about that. 16 of the recommendations are directly, directly related to the records management system that is critical. And I'm happy to report that I met on that today with NETCOM and the Sheriff's Office is strongly considering also uh, jumping into this RFP with us. So that would put almost every major police agency in the county on the same system. That would be huge in terms of the ability to collect information, share it with one another, take a look at crime stats. I mean, we, take a hard look at jurisdictions and location, uh, crooks don't. They don't care about crossing over into Live Oak or past 7th Street, which the sheriff's area. So this will be good information. It'll be a great way to do this. They will also uh, shoulder some of the cost and the burden of that system. So that will be important as well. Uh, some of these do include capital improvement project money, uh, which we will again merge in to see what the city's priorities are and uh, figure those out as we go. Develop a mission statement. Well, we were already underway, and so we've got that completed, and this is the mission statement. And just to remind uh, council, uh, the mission statement came uh, from meeting with the communities, meeting individually with community members, taking all that data, and then giving it to our sergeants to turn into a mission statement, which went to patrol, who highlighted the words that they felt were really important to them, and then that went to the command staff, which, uh, 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 penciled this out and made sure that it was something that everybody could, uh, could understand and agree to, and it was very well received. 
I was very impressed by the amount of attention and detail and care that each of our employees took. Uh, I would figure, I figured that, you know, 50% of our employees would stand back with their arms crossed saying, why do I have to do this? I'd rather be out working. But what I found was exactly the opposite. They were thirsty for it, they were hungry for it, and they all uh, pitched in. And, uh, and I think the result is we have a great product. Uh, secession planning was very important uh, in, uh, to, in the study as well as to the department. That was identified ahead of time by many of our employees. And so uh, and we need to ensure that employees are trained and mentored to serve as future leaders. That was recommendation number two. Well, took that seriously. Uh, we already have a spot secured for the FBI National Academy in 2019, uh, 2019 as quick as we could get it. And uh, one of the purposes of us redistricting and doing this neighborhood policing is so that these uh, lieutenants who are fairly young and will probably out, outlast many of us in the department will uh, be the future leaders. And so they are acting as the chief of police for a section of the city and allowing them to handle the crime control, handle the personnel, handle the handle the uh, complaints from community members and balance all of those things. And so I think that uh, all of them are rising uh, to that level and, uh, and are just doing a fantastic job. And then uh, we're also offered other schools for the mid-management and the senior management of our department to make sure that they can go and receive some of the best training in the country. And that's one of the reasons Bernie is down in, uh, in Los Angeles right now. To develop a strategic plan, a part of the uh, a strategic plan that was developed, and there's a copy of the front page for you. Uh, this was underway, and, uh, but we, were, we agreed with everything they said about that, and so we call it the leadership plan instead of, instead of a strategic plan. It's just a semantical uh, thing, uh, but uh, for us, it's more of a direction of where are we going and how are we getting there and what are the milestones we want to accomplish. And uh, certainly anybody can avail themselves of that uh, copy, which is also on the web. So, but what's the priority of policing? The priority of policing is to uh, prevent and control crime, uh, pure and simple. Unfortunately, you can look at these crime rates and see that uh, it's an area that we need to do a lot better in. Even if you adjust our, our crime rates to include the university, us as a county seat, the center of tourism, and, and all of that, we're still too high. And uh, this is something we have to deal with and we have to accept responsibility for as a police agency and as a city, and as a county government, it's not just us, it's everybody, and really work on these numbers because each one of those numbers represent uh, a citizen. And, uh, and so we need to, uh, to work on that. So our goal through this process is to be more effective in how we control crime. You look at the trend line, how we've done over the last, uh, you know, several years, this is through 2015, and it's fairly close to that uh, currently. The red line uh, represents just the, the, the average of what you take all those numbers and divide it out. So it stays fairly consistent. And, um, you know, we're, I asked a couple people who were here long before me what, you know, what was the big dip in violent and property crime in 2008, and uh, we don't know. Um, there could have been a variety of things that affected that, but that seems to be the, uh, the aberration that goes outside of, outside of standard, standard deviation. But for the most part, uh, it's, it stayed fairly consistent over that time frame. Violent crime as well, down the, in the green line at the bottom. But the point of this is, it's something that we have to work on, and we want to see us dipping below that, that, that imaginary red line rather than above it. This is a uh, hotspot map of the city of where crime and calls for service uh, occur. And uh, you can see that it clusters in five areas of the city. And so uh, these are the areas that we need to spend the most time and effort and energy on working and reducing those calls so we can get at the crime uh, that's associated with it. Obviously, the, the brighter red, the location, uh, the more calls for service we have. This is a typical of what a uh, crime analysis report might look like. Uh, this came from the study itself. These are some of the locations where we have the highest calls for service and uh, our crime locations in the city. And you can see that it is, um, other than the police department, we don't have that much crime occurring there, but we have a lot of crime reported there. And uh, so people come into the front counter and, and, uh, 
and say, hey, I've been a victim of crime, so we go and take the reports, obviously. Um, so you can see that crime clusters in locations, and, uh, and we'll get into a little bit more of that later. So one of the selected recommendations, I'm not gonna go through all the recommendations, it would take uh, forever and a day, but uh, one of the selected recommendations is, is, they say, is to consider other strategies. And I think that that is important. So in the chart that you see here, here are some of the strategies. And if you, if you could take that bar and scroll down, I just did a screenshot, so you won't be able to do that. But if you could take that bar and scroll down, you'd see a variety of strategies uh, to reduce crime. On the right side is uh, what happened in, in, with crime uh, through neighborhood policing, the strategy that we have chosen, as well as um, a, a Comstat model and, and departments throughout the nation. Now, these are obviously much larger cities. This is also uh, coming on the end of the crack cocaine epidemic. So it's probably disproportionately uh, a reduction. However, uh, the point is there's two main strategies in policing that have been used. And uh, one is this Comstat model uh, the other is neighborhood policing and problem solving. I have chosen uh, for our department to move towards neighborhood policing and problem solving for a variety of reasons, which we'll get into. Uh, but uh, uh, this is our goal. Our goal with this is to let our heroes, the guys and, and women in blue, to do their job. And right now they seem stymied. Uh, and calls for service crowding out the opportunity to police. And again, <clears throat> we'll get that further. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the focus of how we police is, enforce, is important. And uh, if you look at, at, the, at the data, it would suggest that 61% of crime occurs in 10% of locations. So the theory then would be to police the problems that are the most problematic, the locations that are most problematic. 54% um, of crime approximately is committed by 10% of criminals. So rather than focusing on everybody, you focus on those who are most problematic. I just got this, uh, the next bullet down here, 3.4 miles of the streets of Santa Cruz account for most of our fatal and serious injury collisions. And um, that came from uh, Vision Zero uh, and uh, that's being done through the county and uh, as well as our uh, Smart Streets uh, program. So rather than randomly running traffic on streets that we don't have problems, it makes a lot more sense to focus on where the problems are. And you do that through either finding the right handler to, to control the offender, uh, bringing the right manager to control the place, or uh, their guardian to, uh, to protect the victims. So um, overall, if you, uh, I know it's a pretty small font, but uh, Comstat model versus neighborhood policing model, I think down at the bottom is, is the most salient point. Comstat model is kind of viewed as an occupational force where um, a stop and frisk and uh, and uh, zero tolerance policing was the, uh, was, the, was the cry and it wound up in federal lawsuits. Whereas the other side, it was uh, neighborhood policing is more of a relational uh, responsibility between the police and the community working together to solve community problems. Hmm. We cannot solve these problems without the community. It's as simple as that. And so our choice has been to move forward with this on uh, a problem or in a policing model where we look at crime, we analyze why it's occurring at a, at a specific location and solve those problems. It's like when you have a neighborhood and you get a dope house in that neighborhood. Well, what starts happening in the neighborhood, that cancer you know, metastasizes throughout the community. And then you start getting car burglaries and then you get noise complaints and you get all these other things. So if you can take out that cancer, that, that node, it can bring that community back to, to normalcy. And that's the purpose of problem-oriented policing. We get a lot of um, people who are addicted to alcohol hanging out at Front and uh, SoCal, where we have a lot of calls for service. So we're working with that business on making sure that they secure the alcohol there so that they can't get it and steal it. That just makes a little bit of sense. And you watch, if we're able to successfully do that, the calls for service, the crime will, in that neighborhood will drop significantly. That diffusion of benefit is, is what we want to get in each of these neighborhoods. And it's gonna be addressing those problems one by one. What we've asked our lieutenants to do is to be thoughtful about prioritizing the calls, prioritizing the problems, excuse me, in, the, in each neighborhood, be responsible for that, and figure out how to drive those crimes down in that neighborhood. And so when they focus and prioritize those, the bigger problems first, 
we can stay on top of those and start having that benefit of other crimes being addressed just because we dealt with that one cancer cell, if you will. Neighborhood policing is uh, decentralized. Uh, we also have redeployed every staff member to the field uh, that we could possibly uh, redeploy. Uh, there's a couple people that we didn't. One is a staff sergeant to help the lieutenants and the sergeants run the organization. Uh, the other is a, um, our school resource officer, which right now we think is really important. And then the third person is our gang officer uh, who, who is uh, just doing a stellar job in keeping on top of the gang problems as part of the uh, countywide gang task force, which is Watsonville, uh, CHP, um, Capitola, and ourselves. And then we want to make sure that uh, we're doing two other things that are important to me. One is that we're accountable for our crime control. Is crime going up or down in a neighborhood and how, do the, how does the community know? We want to make sure that we're posting that in a, in a location where every community member can come on and see what's going on in their neighborhood, more than just DOS, but looking at heat maps, looking at crime percentage totals, looking at uh, the incidence of crime uh, before um, you know, the, the application of our response. And then the last one is community engagement. Uh, we want to make sure that we're getting feedback from the community as well as building that relationship with the public where we, we can employ their help uh, to, uh, to deal <laughs> with many of these problems. For instance, if we're having a car burglary problem in the Upper West neighborhood, uh, community members can help us by walking the neighborhood with flashlights at a certain time of night if we can analyze that, that, that deep into the data. I know of one city, for instance, that uh, got uh, flashing collars for all their dogs, uh, red and blue flashing collars and they took the dogs out for a walk at nighttime when uh, they were most likely to have car burglary problems in the neighborhood. Didn't confront people, it's just that visual presence of a community that cared and people outside. So uh, th there's many things and in innovative ideas that we can do. So what gets in our way? Why can't the, why can't the police do this? And uh, if you look to the left side of the screen here, uh, this, is, this came directly from uh, CPSM. Uh, departments average between 400 and 1,000 calls per 1,000 residents. The lower the number suggests a better policy on triaging non-emergency calls for service. Top of the page, you can see what Santa Cruz is. We're above the highest, that we're the highest they've ever seen. So we're averaging almost 1,100 calls per 1,000 residents. And in my opinion, coming in from the outside and just taking a look at this, um, it's far too much. And uh, we can get into the specifics of that. But the question is then how do we triage better? And um, that becomes a, a, a thing, a discussion point in a policy matter. So uh, this is kind of, you know, tongue in cheek, but uh, if you remember seeing this Lucy um, episode where they're, the chocolate's going down the conveyor belt and at first it's, oh, that's this is fine. There's, you know, she eats one and then packages two and, then the conveyor belt gets going faster and faster and faster, and then she's stuffing them in her hat and in her mouth, and, and then the lady comes in and yells, speed it up. That's what our officers feel like right now, that the, that the chocolate is on a, the calls for service are on a high-speed conveyor belt, and then somebody yells, speed it up. And uh, it's to the point where many of them feel like they're at, the, they're at the water level. And so this is something that my responsibility is to help them fix. So um, our mantra has been for many years, no call too small. If you call us, we'll come. And according to CPSM, that this is uh, characteristic of a small town uh, mentality, of a small town uh, you know, thought process. Now, Santa Cruz is not a San Francisco, but we are an urban area and certainly an area with urban problems. And so somehow we have to take a look at this and figure out what can we do to provide them the opportunity um, to, to actually police. Because in that margin between proactivity and reactivity is where we can find the greatest crime control. And, uh, and I think that's what's important. Uh, I mean, some quotes from the thing. It's an enormous misuse of emergency personnel is what these experts were, were telling us. And here's just some of the areas that they, that they took a look at and the frequency of calls. So, you know, we can't certainly not av avoid uh, taking reports on 1,500 uh, crashes every year. But there are some that we shouldn't go to. 
uh, ordinance violations, it takes us on average 130 minutes to get there. And the reason for that is there's so many calls stacked up of those kind. So rather than just saying we're just not gonna go to them, the question becomes, well, how do we manage them and how do we deal with them uh, in a thoughtful way? And then um, you can see the other ones uh, for yourself. So we respond physically to about 68,000 uh, calls a year. And a couple of you ha had asked me, well, wait a second, I thought the number was over 100,000. And, uh, and we took a good hard look at the data. And what we found out is that a lot of those calls are information only calls. In other words, uh, fires running code three to, through town. There's a person who's wanted from San Jose, might be in the area, a, a bolo, uh, be on the lookout. So but the calls we're actually responding to are 68,000. CPSM estimates that we could reduce up to 22,000 of those calls. I don't think we can reduce that many from looking at the information. But if we can reduce several calls a day, uh, that gives our officers that margin, that time uh, to, be, to be proactive. So calls for service are kind of a domino effect. Uh, the average wait time for non-emergency calls for service, the benchmark uh, that, that CPSM says is acceptable is 15 minutes. We're at 25 minutes on average. And then dispatch hold times are 16 minutes in and of themselves. So the dispatchers are sitting on that call for 16 minutes. The reason they're sitting on that call is there's no units available. So what I hear frequently is the dispatcher telling the officers or the sergeant, uh, we just sent you to a, a burglary in progress, but I'm also holding a camping call, a, uh, a disturbance at such and such location, this location and that location. And it's, it's kind of like when your mother tells you to clean your room and sweep the garage and wash the car. And it's just so overwhelming that sometimes you just give up. And uh, I don't want to put our officers in that position. And we're dealing with the, them broadcasting too much at once. However, these numbers, the more, the more backed up it gets, it's that domino effect of it continues to uh, elongate and then and people just get, again, fatigued listening to that. Um, priority calls for service. The benchmark is five minutes. Uh, we're at almost seven minutes. And dispatch hold time is 2.3 minutes. So if we can get rid of that hold time because we're more efficient, we can get pretty close to those numbers without really making too much of a stretch. And, um, and I think that's something we certainly want to, to head towards. Call mismanagement. So it slows response times and stacks more calls. It shortens the benchmark time of calls when, when officers are there. So what this means is when an officer is on scene in most departments, they're there for almost 30 minutes, 28.7 minutes. Here, we're there for 25 minutes because you're constantly thinking, I gotta get to the next call, the next call, citizens waiting, the next call's holding. And so we want them to do is slow down a little bit, take, take their time to actually talk to people and do a little bit more thorough investigations when you have the opportunity. It's also a little bit dangerous because on, on average, uh, the average city sends 1.7 officers to a call, we send 1.6 which means that uh, uh, often we're not sending enough officers to these calls. Uh, and that's more dangerous for the citizens. It's also more dangerous for our officers. So th they came up with a policy uh, many cities use called the rule of 60. And that is 60% of your officers should be in patrol and that 60% of their day should be consumed by calls for service. In other words, 40% of the day should be available for proactive policing, for handling administrative duties, for having lunch, uh, for, you know, this isn't a take a break thing. Uh, right now, most of our officers do, don't take lunch during the day, and they certainly don't get breaks. So this is called the saturation, saturation index. And um, you can see the, uh, the numbers as it speaks here. And uh, uh, very frequently, there's, there we're well above that, those numbers. And uh, so we got, again, this is what we need to fix. Um, when officers experience a workload of greater than 60%, as that middle box says, they become increasingly reactive, waiting for the next call. Um, and through much of the day, our SI surpassed the threshold. So 60% of our officers should be designated to patrol. So here's our current numbers. 
We have 94 funded positions. However, the city manager has approved us to go up to 99 positions uh, if we could fulfill these numbers and we're not there right now. Right now we have seven vacancies. This has been tough to hang on to people. And, uh, and we're interviewing people, I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but one of the things we're hearing uh, is that uh, why do I wanna do this here for the same or less money than somewhere else I can work literally half as hard? And, um, and I understand that. Uh, but I'm thankful for the ones who want to be here because they want to work hard. And uh, that's what most of our department is. Uh, we have five currently in training. Um, we have five unable to work because of injuries. Uh, that's actually risen in the last couple of days to seven. Uh, so we can take away from that, but they'll be back shortly, we hope. 47 in patrol, that includes sergeants and lieutenants. And then uh, if we have 14 in neighborhood policing teams that can augment patrol if the need be. And then five administrative assignments, such as uh, the chiefs, a IA sergeant, and a staff sergeant. We have 10 investigators and, uh, and nine CSOs. The, the one officer there is not, not correct. So um, that's where our current staffing is. Uh, we also have a lot of civilian, uh, not a lot of civilian staff. We have, uh, I think, 15 additional civilian staff working at different functions in the department, such as records and property and, and uh, so forth. We've also extended three job offers in the last week uh, to new people um, to, who are going to go to the academy, but we're also trying to find people who are lateral transfers because they can hit the ground running. And I think that's, that's kind of important. This is a uh, spattle uh, representation of um, officer-initiated calls for service. You can see where the officers spend their time being proactive in the city and where they're calling out that they're contacting people, almost mirrors exactly uh, what you saw in the crimes for service. And uh, this is where they're at. The central question becomes the levels of service in Santa Cruz desires. Do you desire greater crime control uh, by allowing officers time to be proactive? Then how do we do it? We can do it one of a couple ways, add officers or first try to reconfigure the staffing that we have in the, in the current calls for service to meet those numbers. And, um, and I think that's as we're gonna push forward here. So this is again a look at the, uh, at the current uh, budget as it stands right now, and then as we move forward. Now one of the things that uh, staffing comparison that we need to take a look at is over the last decade, we've added about 9,000 residents to the city. We've not added more officers. That'd be like taking a city the size of um, Scotts Valley and not having any officers to patrol it. Uh, so we're currently at uh, 1.46 officers per thousand residents uh, with council approval if we, and the overhire, if we could fill those positions, we'd be at 1.52. That would be a huge blessing if we could get up to that level and, and get all those positions filled. I mean, that would be a gigantic relief. Um, available for duty because of injuries, we're down the 1.3 area. Uh, the national uh, target, which CPSM talks about, is 2.0 officers per thousand. But I, I want to be uh, honest with that. California is normally much lower. Um, most cities in California are not at the two, two per thousand level. Uh, and, but that doesn't mean that uh, that's not a goal to achieve someday. So what are our staffing concerns? About three out of 100 are hired. For every 100 people that take the test, we wind up uh, you know, going through the funnel and hiring three. It's tough. Um, and then uh, attrition is high. Um, burnout is a substantial risk for injury rates. I think that's one of the reasons we have several people on light duty. So here's the tough part. Of the last nine hired, uh, Dan Filippo has been doing a great job getting people through the door. And he's really worked on a marketing campaign and we've been finding the bodies. But of the last nine we've hired, two failed the academy, one quit during the academy, three quit during training, and they, the exit interviews were, this is too busy, I can't keep up with the workload. And then for now, the other three are doing well. Um, so there's th three throng, a uh, three-pronged approach. Uh, one is reduce the demand, eliminate some of the calls for service through differential response. That doesn't mean we won't respond to them. If we have to find different ways to respond to them. Increase patrol resources by reconfiguring the patrol schedule 
which we're currently working on, or hire more police officers to get fully staffed. And, um, and all three of those are, are underway. So we've impaneled a committee uh, inside the department to uh, look at calls for service and how to reduce those uh, unnecessary calls to be more in line with what other police agencies are doing around the country and around the state. Um, I can go into a lot of examples of this, but for the sake of time, I think we'll, we'll hold off on that. Uh, considering, consider different staffing configurations such as 12-hour shifts or 10-hour shifts with more squads. And so uh, uh, Arnold Vasquez, under the direction of uh, Deputy Chief Martinez, has been working on that diligently. Uh, this, uh, it's important for us to take a look at these and uh, we're, we're heading down that road. Um, uh, Deputy Chief Filippo has been doing the calls for service. They've already met with uh, members of the department. Now the next step is to meet with members of the community uh, to make sure that we're in line with what the community expects. And then leverage all department resources to address these hotspots uh, and these hotspot locations uh, as they come up, including the hot people. One of the things we've implemented is a, is a program uh, we're using one of our CSOs as a crime analyst to discuss um, uh, some of the most people who are most problematic in the city. So we've identified top people, 10 top people who are getting arrested the most or causing the most problems, focusing on them and really working with the DA's office, the sheriff and the chief of probation to solve, to solve the problems uh, with those people. I met with them, had lunch with them. We all discussed it, we agreed. And then the very next week, I just wanna give credit to the DA, sends me an email, hey, this is one of your guys, I want you to know we're taking this to the mat. And um, so uh, one individual has been arrested over 200 times, is on probation multiple times. And, uh, and uh, then he threatened to kill some of our officers. And, uh, and it was a real threat. So long story short, the DA took that seriously. We're working together, focusing on those things. And I think that we can hopefully have some uh, some impact on that. Um, examining staffing levels, I think we've covered this, uh, this whole idea of no call too small, but the point is uh, we gotta think a little bit differently. Um, so I think it becomes a choice, a political choice to be very honest. Uh, do we continue to provide police services as they are now or take steps to restructure how to respond to the demand? And, um, and this is gonna be a tough, a tough thing to, to walk through, but I think it's important for us to understand uh, what CPSM said, said, what their ideas are, what others are doing so that we can, we can push forward in this, in this vein. The reengineering process, um, we went through the talk to our staff, the community, the city leadership, and then boiled it down to get our mission statement. Uh, and that was what we re was reflected earlier. The mission statement uh, went for our sergeants, the officers, and then ultimately the command staff to come up with this document. I would again encourage uh, any community member to read it so they know uh, what we're about. And uh, this all came from them at those meetings that we did initially for the first several months. And then uh, look for the diffusion of benefit as we march through these, uh, these problems and make sure that we're solving them. Uh, we're examining the staffing formulas, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I think this is this, uh, uh, an important point. For every 1,700 calls we manage better, it's the equivalent of, of adding one additional police officer. And uh, this is a cost savings measure as much as a, a, a better way to police. Uh, we, especially when you take a look at the cost of a fully benefited officer is 183,000 and a fully benefited sergeant's 208,000. So if you're adding a dozen officers, you're talking an enormous amount of money. And then lastly, this is what our, our new neighborhood um, uh, map looks like. This is the uh, community and, uh, and each lieutenant is noted up in the upper left corner in, in, in the co proper color code, coded um, part of the map. And uh, any community member can click on the map on our website and find out who the lieutenant is and, uh, and shoot them an email or get them information about what's happening in their neighborhood and lieutenants will respond uh, pretty quickly. So I submit to you this uh, report and I certainly answer any questions uh, that you might have at your leisure. Well, at this point, is there any council member that'd like to ask any questions regarding the report? I'll ask one before we go to public comment. And that she mentioned that um, there are external forces that hinder the police from doing their job. You know, it looks like when I saw that statistic over the last um, eight years, that our crime rate has been relatively constant. And 
so what are those things other than the fact that the council is directed over filling police staffing and resources? What are those external factors that we as a council can help address to help influence that aside from the recommendations today? Um, I think there are several things that you, that uh, council can take a look at um, and, and help us with. Uh, one is that uh, for many years, we have sold to the community to pick up the phone and dial 911 on everything. So unfortunately, the expectation of the community becomes, I pick up the phone, I call 911, I want a cop right now. Well, it may not be an emergency call for service and we're not gonna be there for two hours. Well, all that does is set us up for failure, the city up for failure and the community member up for failure. So we've gotta retrain and rethink that of, of using the non-emergency number when it's not an emergency. Uh, the second thing is, um, we certainly understand the dynamic of, of the court system the justice system here in Santa Cruz as well as California. And for crime, for crime control to be effective, it has to be certain, swift, and fair. Um, I don't think we can reach those two numbers, the, the, the certain and swift. Um, and, and the reason for that is when we put people on probation for five times over, they didn't learn the first time. I doubt they're gonna learn the second or third time. So this really has to become a public policy matter for our entire community of how do we, how do we deal with that? And this lays, a, you know, the courts have to help us and understand, and I think the courts are willing to understand if the community uh, lets them know what the desire of this community is, is to whether it's to be a little bit tougher on sentencing. When we arrest a gang member or a felon with a firearm multiple times, um, that person at some point needs to go to prison. Uh, to, to learn the lesson, to be rehabilitated you know, because of that. The other third thing I think is important is um, you know, much of the homeless thing has been thrust on the shoulders of the police department as a solution. I think we've really come to the realization this is not a solution and that we need to work and we are working in concert with the rest of city government to really work on solving these problems. And I couldn't be more proud of the other department heads, the manager's office, of how we've all taken this task on together. But this also has to come from the county. This is a county responsibility. Uh, they have the budget and the funding for it. They also have the legislative mandate. And, uh, they, and we could really use their assistance in helping drive the policy forward uh, on how we collectively deal with these problems as a city. So there's just some really quick things that might be able to be done uh, from, a, from a legislative perspective. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Crone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here this evening and for all the work you do. And I appreciate the report. It's helpful to, and I read through the report in detail. So um, many of the things that you talked about have been talking about resonate with the, the statistics that I have seen, I um, am wondering about a couple of things. One, um, in terms of the recommendations that are coming to us, just a little, if, if you could talk a little bit about the community service officer model versus the role of the Rangers, and um, you know, just to help us and others in the room have a better understanding of why we're, um, we've increased our, um, and again, some of you have been involved in these discussions over the years that I haven't been on the council previously. But just a little bit about that. And then a second question is, um, you know, I really appreciate the uh, direction to move in uh, to neighborhood policing and setting up the, the regions and, and teams. And I've been to a couple of the events where uh, lieutenants have spoken to uh, uh, very um, energetic audiences. And so I, I think it's great to be moving in this direction. I do wonder if you've considered Oh, uh, a model that includes some kind of satellite. I'm, I'm just thinking about places on in different parts of the city that people can go to, um, you know, either be part, you know, just communicate their concerns. You know, may, maybe having some satellite offices might reduce um, some of the calls that go in through central dispatch. I don't know, but I just would be interested to hear if you've can, thought about that at all. Sure. Um First of all, the community service officer model, uh, that has been done in many police departments uh, to relieve the workload that is experienced by uh, officers taking reports, some accident reports, some minor theft reports, and, and so forth. Um, 
Uh, it's been used effectively here, and I think it's an important model. We also have them in positions where we, inside the department where we don't want to have sworn officers doing that because a person who's sworn uh, and tr fully trained, post-certified, all that kind of thing, really can, do, uh, can only do things that nobody else can do. And so we really want to save them for the stuff they need to be used for. So it has been effective in doing that. I think also some of the city's thinking in the past has been it's pretty difficult to hire and find police officers. And this is a little bit less expensive model, uh, the CSO, so they're, and they're hardworking employees. So uh, maybe we've gone towards that. And I think that was, in my opinion, a very proper thing to do. Uh, the Rangers, um, I think, fulfill a fantastic role and have done a great job in this city. And, um, and I think that uh, we can't speak highly enough of the, of the, uh, of the people that have, you know, have done that. Uh, again, they can't do the full scope of things. And so part of the problem becomes um, if they tell somebody, hey, you got to leave the park. No, I'm not. Uh, there's nobody to stand behind them. Part of the idea to bring them over the police department is they have somebody, a team of officers standing behind them now in each area of the city. And working with that team and be embedded in that team allows them to do their jobs, be a little bit more effective. And then as you saw from the report, there's a lot of back, uh, backstory information stuff that has to take place with people who are 832 PC certified, which would mean that the police department is really in the best position to do that. And so we think that the Rangers can continue to do a stellar job uh, providing a great high level of service throughout the, uh, throughout the city, but mostly focused on the parks. Just the second question on yes. uh, satellite offices. Yeah. Some kind of well, yes. Outside of the downtown. Yeah, one of the things we have discussed is uh, having the, uh, maybe some of the libraries, for instance, have a spot where the officers can go and write reports. And uh, so we have discussed that. Uh, we've also discussed fire stations. I know they've tried that in the past. But we've also, the lieutenants have been pretty committed to making sure that they're meeting with community members on a regular basis so that they can have face-to-face -face <laughs> contact in each neighborhood with community members. Uh, and I know that uh, they've been responsive. I've already been to several meetings with uh, several of the lieutenants, um, meeting with community groups. And so they've been doing a fantastic job. And I know that I'm hearing from community members, hey, I spoke with Lieutenant Lamas, and he did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. So I know that they're doing it on their own as well. And uh, so that's... I think that's the step in the right direction. Councilmember Crown, then Councilmember Chase. Yeah, um, I wanted to follow up on Councilmember Brown's uh, question because it, it's not still not clear to me. <clears throat> um, when when a CSO tells somebody to leave the park, are they going to leave the park, or do they also need backup? Well, CSOs normally aren't in that position. Uh, they can write some citations like Rangers, uh, but CSOs are also embedded on those teams. So I was, I was looking at this. The, the difference is there's. A little, a little bit more for CSOs, it seems like, as far as pay goes. So we're, I was looking at the city manager, but different uh, pay ranges. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you see a future at all of going, say we had 30 or 40 CSOs, and would that cut down on the number of sworn officers? I don't see us being able to go that direction uh, because you still have a lot of crimes that need to be responded to. Um, we do see a path, however, for uh, rangers, should they choose uh, to go into the CSO or sworn side uh, or a staff position inside the department, that this is a, a career path that they could take uh, should they want to. But I don't see us changing the ratio a whole lot because, again, it takes a, a sworn officer to do much of the workload that we're tasked with. Could you talk a little bit about um, the use of force? And there's, I'm looking at page seven of the recommendations, but also page 77. And then there's also some recommendations on use of force uh, for park rangers on page 105. And I'm just wondering, you know, one is begin tracking all uses of force by officers as defined by department policy, begin tracking uh, use of force proactive data by uh, individual officer and not only by incident. Begin I was just wondering, have we been doing this already or is this all new, these recommendations from 57 to 61? Yeah, most of what we've been doing already. Um, and I, we we're, weren't really, we were kind of puzzled when we saw this um, because we actually do report this out, as you know, on our website, as well as to the Public Safety Committee. I think what they were looking for is a, um, a review process uh, of a 
use of force expert on all of these cases? Well, most of our sergeants are use of force experts, and every sergeant reads every single use of, not every sergeant reads everyone, but a sergeant reads every single use of force that we do in the city. Uh, what they suggested is that go into IA Pro, where, it could, where we can track that use of force. Um, we certainly can do that. Um, uh, my thought process on that is there's been some recent research that would suggest that the uh, EIS system, early warning systems, are not that effective, that we should look more at trauma that the officers experience rather than um, the number of citations or that kind of thing that the, that the officers are involved in. So the greater chance of a complaint or a systemic problem with the officer is more related to the trauma they've experienced as part of their duties. As far as the Rangers are concerned, um, if you're 832 PC certified, which they are, uh, you have to report that out to the state every year. And so uh, we have to report out every use of force that results in injury to the state. And um, there is no mechanism in place to do, do those kinds of things currently for the Rangers, and, uh, but that will, uh, that will take place under us because that, that's something we understand that, that we just do regularly. Thanks, and also just um, the uh, use of force for the um, Rangers, it says that there's been three incidences in the past 18 months. Is that, is that what you know of to be true as well? Um, and, and I was under the impression that maybe park rangers don't get into use of force issues that, uh, that they're calling for, for backup. Um, I, know of, I know of one for sure, but if they say three, then I would, I would suggest that that probably is the case. Um, actually, I actually know of two. One was a, a ranger did a stellar job. Officer was fighting a, a guy, the same guy that went into the school with the machete. And so we're fighting him downtown, and the officer was in a tough fight and the ranger helped our officer out and had to use force in the process. Uh, the other, uh, another one that I'm aware of, the ranger was punched in the face and, um, and the ranger, you know, foot pursuit and tackled the guy. Uh, so those are considered uses of force. Uh, I don't know what the other one is because it might've happened before I got here, but so they, they can use force. Uh, they have been trained to do arrest and control uh, to use in, but now at the police department, our what we want to make sure is that we use the minimal amounts of force possible to overcome the resistance that they're, that they're facing. And uh, that is uh, in-house training that we will provide on an ongoing basis to the Rangers uh, to make sure that they're in line with uh, what's common uh, throughout policing. Last question is about um, complaints on page um, six of the, of the recommendations, professional standards. Um, or have these been implemented too? Because they develop a protocol for at least monthly contact with complainants to advise them of the status of the investigation of their complaint. This would come as great news to many people who have filed complaints and then it sort of falls into a black hole and they never hear, even when they ask a year later, um, there is no response. And how are we doing now? We are going to be notifying people every month. We'll have a, make sure that a letter is written to them uh, that, they will, that they will have some type of documentation in their hand. Um, I think some of the issue is sometimes people want more information than we can give them by law, but we'll still make contact with them and make sure that they're uh, informed of what's, uh, where their, their complaint lies. Yeah, a lot of times people just want to know that you're, somebody cares and yes. you know, taken seriously. Yeah, and I can tell you these all are taken seriously. One of the other um, suggestions with the, the IA sergeant meets with the chief regularly. Well, his office is about 20 feet from mine. Um, so he walks in there literally three times a, three times a week. Uh, so uh, we're, we're working on those suggestions. Thank and, you. And I'll just say as someone who's a member and been on the public safety committee for the, I think since the time I've been on the council, I can guarantee you that these complaints are taken with the utmost of seriousness and investigated thoroughly. Um, there's reports that take place annually and the officers that are in charge and assigned to investigate those through internal affairs, they are available to take calls and will respond upon request by any um, constituent, any member of the public that, that submits a, uh, a concern or even wants to follow up. So, I mean, on that point, I would say maybe it's a matter of having some information. If someone's uh, sent, made a comment to you, that information is available, and um, I think those people can readily follow up. So, I, I'm not sure if you were speaking to something in particular. Yeah, but it hasn't happened in several cases, but, you know, we can follow up. <laughs>
but he's assuring us that monthly reports will be taking place because I know folks who have made complaints and it's been a year. And I just want to add nothing. I just want to add too on the Public Safety Committee, we do get a list of, um, you know, counting of uses of force too. So it is taken, you know, taken seriously. There is a tally, and those of us on that committee do see those detailed reports. City Manager, um, uh, the other layer of, of oversight that we have, just to point out, is the independent police auditor who also reviews the complaints and uh, uh, you know, provides recommendations to the police department and to the public safety committee related to uh, those complaints as well, and also is available to the public as well. Chris, you don't, don't go. Ahead. Just if I can just finish, and if you have somebody that has not heard from us, <coughs> if you can give me their name, I'll make sure <coughs> we, they hear from us. Okay, thanks, appreciate it. Is that it? Uh, Councilmember Chase. Yeah, I wanted to thank you for the report, which is data-driven, and I really appreciate that. And I think what's interesting about that is that 16 of the recommendations mention the RMS system and the records management system, which is what provides a lot of the data and is incredibly problematic. So I know that that is a big budget request, and so I think it would be helpful to let council know what we can anticipate in terms of what you think um, that would be, what your request would be, and the timeline of that so that we can consider that, because I think it's incredibly important if we want to continue to see this type of analysis and these types of improvements. Sure. Um, please take this with a grain of salt because we haven't done the RFP, uh, so we can't uh, really know for sure what it's going to cost. Um, the, the systems will range about a million dollars, but again, we're dividing that between multiple agencies. And if you stretch it out over a multi-year period, it becomes very reasonable. And um, so what, what we heard today was that our, our, year, our annual cost for running the system, the maintenance, upkeep, and all that kind of thing, including servers in the future and, and so forth, is, should be around $70,000, maybe a little bit more. And then uh, the actual cost of the system uh, is about $200,000 for everybody per year. So uh, we should be able to do this for around $100,000, $150,000 a year. I appreciate that. That actually isn't very much considering the improvement and what we would get for it. Um, and to be connected with the other law enforcement agencies, or at least one of them, I think is critical as well. Yeah, all four are in. Yeah, that's great. And, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been in our capital improvement program budget for some time now, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, council member. Or council I just had one last comment. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to also thank you for just mentioning in response to Councilmember Crone's question, um, the impact of trauma and how that impacts, um, well, really everybody involved in public safety. So I, I'm interested to hear more about that. One of the recommendations just to uh, glom onto that is uh, officer wellness. And so one of our um, strategies in, the, in, the, uh, in our leadership plan is really working on officer wellness and employee uh, improvement. And so including succession planning and all that. And I just really, uh, again, Dan Filippo, it, well before I got here, had already started a mentoring program. And so we're really trying to mentor our people, keep an eye on things like abuses of substances because this is, there's so much trauma in the job. So um, I just wanna, you know, we wanna head that direction, but it had even, even more so there. Council, I read it. Councilmember Ryan and then Councilmember Matthews. So uh, I can't help but, you know, be just completely stunned about the level of crime that really jumped out at me at the report. Uh, you know, we've all had numbers. We see different numbers in terms of where Santa Cruz is in comparison. And uh, it doesn't really matter what scale, whether it's the FBI or somebody else collecting data, we are always end up being um, on the top in an area that I'd rather rather like to be average. <laughs> and so, you know, I you look at those numbers and, you know, you're, you're doing these different plans, but are there plans to go after specific types of crimes? Like when I look at property crime, it's so high. Uh, is there a strategy aside from looking at it, you know, piecemeal through the city, but to have an overall, um, uh, I guess, strategy in how to lower that number? Well, that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, just let me throw a word of caution uh, in when you look at crime data. Uh, one is uh, you have to take a look at our city, the reality of our city. Again, it's the county seat, the center of this region, um, a tourist attraction. I mean, three to four million people a year go through the boardwalk. All that really affects the amount of people and the amount of crime uh, in, in, a, in a city, including the jail being here and, and all these things. So you can't compare this to, for instance, Lincoln, 
California. Um, you know, they're gonna have a, it's a bedroom community. It's completely different. Now, having said that, it's still too high, and we need to we need to figure out how to get that down. So, if you if you took this a look at this and actually figured this was a city of a hundred thousand, um, probably be a little bit more realistic uh, in terms of the crime rate. However, it's not what we have, so we're gonna we're gonna fix that. So, the strategy is this: uh, each community told us what their priorities were: theft, theft, and theft in many of these communities. And so um, each lieutenant has set their priorities for their communities. And their job is to figure out, based on the micro problem solving side, how to fix each of those problems. So I'm setting an overall department wide philosophy of policing, which is neighborhood policing and problem solving. Now their job is to drill down for the, each of those communities and figure out what specific tactic are they gonna use to reduce those problems. So, for instance, um, just go back to CVS, 189 thefts or, or, or crimes at that location in one year. That's unacceptable. And so what we need to do is if we can drive the crime down there, it frees up officers to be more proactive. So his, he, what he did is he went and looked at the environmental conditions that are allowing that crime to take place at that location, talked to the owners or the managers, worked with them, you know, they're gonna go through a stage of, and Carter Jones is here, Carter was uh, with him doing this, uh, going through the stage of locking up the alcohol first. If that doesn't work, putting a security guard at the front door, demanding backpacks be left at the front. You know, let me see your receipt before you get out like you're at Costco. So <laughs> the more they do that, the more that impacts that crime and drops it down. And that's, that's the goal that we're after. So I can't give you the specific overall strategy other than we're focusing on the constant, the constant criminals that we're dealing with and, and really trying to, if we have to give them 365 days in jail one day at a time, then we're gonna do it with those 10. Um, but 10 is a pretty small number. And when you take a look at the amount of, of thieving that we have in the city, but we have to start someplace. And, and uh, the first 10 we put out, I asked um, uh, my crime analyst today, all 10 were contacted all 10 were arrested and, and you know, and then the first group. You know, so we wanna make sure that we're gonna hold them accountable at some level. If probation can't do it because uh, they're overwhelmed, then we'll do it as best we can. And so taking this, you know, putting, employing these strategies, do you have an estimate on when you think we might see a difference? I might see crime drop or these, these figures improve. I understand we're an outlier as a city and it's hard to compare ourselves to anybody else. We're a town of 65,000 that has a university and a major tourist attraction. There aren't a lot of other cities to be able to, to look at, at that and compare. But I, I still do think it's important, and you point that out, to acknowledge that our crime rate is pretty high. Yes. And so I, I'm glad you do acknowledge that. But do you, if, if these things we're putting in place mm -hmm. are successful, how long does it take to see a difference? Well, it's gonna take some time. Um, you know, I would hope that uh, as we get our teams in place and, they, and uh, I was just, you know, looking at with the, the statistics of what they were doing already and they've just been nailing it. I mean, they've been, they've been all over it. They've made a lot of arrests, um, taken a lot of guns off the street already. Those things are going to have an effect. And, um, and I can't give you a percentage of decrease, uh, can't prognosticate that. However, I can tell you that if they continue to do their jobs, focused on the major problems first and take care of those problems, you will see a reduction uh, at some point citywide and that, that people can look at. Now, I think what, you know, what we wanted to be able to do is say, okay, look, we took care of this problem. Therefore, this prob we can know for sure that this problem was taken care of. This was you know, 100 crimes. Uh, and then the community can look at that. There are so many things that influence the actual crime rate. Um, you know, if the economy takes a, a left-hand turn, we could see more problems. Um, uh, uh, the heroin addiction level, um, you know, you, more thefts. I mean, th these are all things that influence the crime rate that we may or may not have control over, but we can take a look at these problems and say, we solved this problem, here's how we know that. And here, here's what we did to do that. And then be accountable to the public for that. And, um, you know, you mentioned several ways we could address um, improving staffing. You were saying um, that possibly hiring more officers. Do you have an actual number of officers that you think we should, we should hire? Like when you look at those rates of like the average of California cities, um, how many more would that mean? Well, I would like to just get up to what the city manager's already approved. 
Um, and my thinking on that council member is uh, once we manage the resources that we've already been given well and it's not working, then I don't have any problem coming back to council and saying I need more officers and, and figuring that piece out. But I wanna get up to full staffing first and then use those extra five bodies that we've, we've been graciously given. Get those folks uh, running on all cylinders and then we can take a look at that, um, reduce the attrition levels and, uh, and get people healthy, which is a, another a significant issue for us. Uh, there's two officers I've never met. They've been off that long. And, um, and it's your workman's comp issues. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things boiled into this that are, that's very complex. So once we get that done and, and finish up to that 99 level that we've already been authorized, then I have no problem coming back to council and saying I need more. Okay, and then um, can you give examples of the types of calls for service that we can handle differently? I know you've mentioned a few in some of the community meetings. You know, I heard one time someone call from a restaurant demanding the police show up to, to make the restaurant give them their food for free because they, they had bad service. So I was at a table, I'm like, oh my dear God, they're calling 911 for this. <coughs> so how, uh, um, what types of calls do you think, I mean, that was a, a ridiculous one, yeah. which I hope isn't very common, but how would you take some of the more common calls that are coming and redirect them? So I think, yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of, of, I'd rather look at bigger categories. I mean, I can go into a lot of antidotal yeah. you know, <laughs> stories that I have in the past and you've all heard those, but um, uh, we do uh, follow up phone calls. Somebody calls and uh, then we'll call them back and the people are sometimes like, why are you calling me? I just handle the problem. Um, well, that takes time. Uh, a lot of information stuff, you know, let, let's have an officer go to this location just to provide information. Non-injury collisions, that's really a civil matter. It's not a police matter. Uh, it's between two insurance companies. And, um, and so frequently what happens is people say, I want a cop to come anyway and then we send them. And sometimes we'll send two officers. So these are, um, and frequently when we write those reports, the insurance companies will now call us back and say, I don't like how you wrote this report. I want it changed to have this person be responsible oh, and try no to put kidding. us in the middle of it. Um, wow. We do, there's a lot of those types of calls. Uh, again, I don't wanna say we're just gonna not respond to them, but somebody, we can manage it better how it's responded to. Uh, like for instance, uh, maybe it's gonna have to wait for the neighborhood policing team when they come in on their Monday. Uh, rather than having, having patrol respond to it if it's, if it's not an emergency. Uh, so uh, let's let patrol do the emergency stuff. Let's let neighborhood policing and the teams or other city uh, members handle the other, the other things that maybe don't need to be handled by a police officer. Just before I came, I talked to Chief Raleigh about medical responses. So if a person's laying on the front yard someplace, uh, they may be having a seizure, they may be high, they could, could be a variety of things, and we send two police officers to handle that, a thousand times a year. And so why isn't uh, paramedics doing that? Because um, what we're gonna do is look at them and say, yep, they need paramedics. Um, so those are the kind of things I think that we can be a little bit more thoughtful about, and Jim agreed completely, uh, Chief Raleigh did. And, uh, but now the devil's in the details, how do you work that out? We don't wanna send an right. engine of four, uh, you know, four firefighters to do that. So this becomes a conversation. Great. I do have other questions, but I we, we this is fascinating. After. Right. Yeah, there'll I'll be time afterwards on. also. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe Council Member Matthews, this will be the final question before we open it up for um, public comment. And it may be covered later, but you had these kind of broad sections here, and um, I gather those are pulled from the big report. Or priority. Can you talk to the mic? Oh, the priority tasks you set before you. Um, those seem to be some of them internal operation changes, but some of them uh, are either, um, some of them involve significant changes in the way we operate with our partners, whether it's the courts or the county or whatever, and some of them are capital. And, and what triggered this question was your referral to the um, uh, records management and, and technology. So um, at what point will you be telling us um, aside from the internal stuff, where you need maybe some more um, assistance from us, whether it's budget or engagement. Sure. Um, I think that's a, an ongoing dialogue uh, to have with each of you and, um, and to the council in general. Uh, my way of trying to handle these things is to try to do it 
uh, myself mm -hmm. and sit down, for instance, and work things out with uh, the, the chief of probation, the DA, the, the sheriff, and have those conversations. If I reach a wall that I can't, that I can't overcome, I have no problem going to the city manager and working with council to, uh, to say, we really need your help on this. this is now, now it's time to throw down. Um, <laughs> and if I could just respond to that, um, as this evolves, and I always consider this a, a process of evolution, but um, it's helpful for us to know where you are because those are a lot of the complaints we get. Why, we did a little e email exchange today on this. Yes. What's going on? Why is this happening? And to the extent we know progress is being made or not, that just helps us to res respond to the public. Sure, I appreciate that. And we can certainly do better in that area, making sure mm -hmm. the council is fully informed of what we're doing and why. You know, just like that conversation we had this morning about mm -hmm. the, you know, yeah. the gun thing. Um, uh, those are, you know, those are the things that really need to be focused on here locally. At what point, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to allow certain people who are dangerous to society continue to walk around. And that does become a, a, uh, a pinch point. And part of this is education. Because I get a lot of complaints from people that, you know, why did you let this guy out of jail? And I, um, I'm right. like, well, I don't control the jail. And the sheriff, if he had a choice, he wouldn't let him out either. Um, so these are, those are the things. Education can be a hugely important matter that, uh, that the council could help us with. And, Okay, do you have a, you have a follow up? Yeah, or? to that, I was just going to ask, are you going to be sharing this report with your um, colleagues at the county level? Um, you know, will the city manager, I guess, be showing this report as well to, to your colleagues? As I, I think that, you know, we, they're a community partner. We really need their help in this. And so I hope that there'll be meetings about this report with our, our county officials. Yeah, certainly we could do that. I know you've already shared it with the sheriff, at least, because there's some, some recommendations related to the sheriffs uh, in here as, as it relates to the, the processing of, of uh, prisoners and that sort of thing. So, yes. Great, and that's an area where city council members could help, too. We could go talk to our elected colleagues at the county level as well. Sure. I'll just say before we open up the public comment, I thought those neighborhood meetings were outstanding in terms of like bringing out a category. I had a, um, one of the West Side residents, Nathaniel, told me that he said it was the best public meeting he'd ever uh, attended in terms of having the number of uh, folks that were engaged and um, participating in the process. So I thought it was a good rollout and it's nice to see this more uh, kind of more robust discussion about how we're moving forward. So as before, we, um, before we have any uh, further questions from council, I mean, I'd like to make this opportunity to open it up to the public for comment. And the first speaker is uh, a representative of Huff who wanted to take some additional time. So you have four minutes, uh, Mr. Norse. Um, and then uh, anyone else who wishes to speak on this matter, uh, please line up um, to my left and uh, we'll uh, allow it to begin. So Mr. Norse, you have the floor. Members of the community, mayor, city council, chief mayor. Uh, first of all, uh, David Silva, I'm sure if he could be here today, would like to maybe join in some of my comments, maybe make some different ones. As most of you may know, uh, he died about a week and a half ago in Maputo, Mozambique, uh, probably of pneumonia, and he was buried there uh, a few days ago. Um, the problem with this report for me, is that is what it doesn't say. Although I can, I'll talk a bit about what it does say and my concerns about that. I mean, I'm really speaking to people who want to see some fundamental changes in how uh, the priorities of mass incarceration, policing, the drug war, treatment of the homeless take place, not sort of, you know, shifting around the deck chairs or even making substantive changes in a uh, focus, which is not necessarily bad. But if you have criminalization of the homeless as a priority, this is the group I'm concerned about, then no matter how you change it, you don't really change it at all. Um, folks outside who were forced away from the San Lorenzo campground by its closing on February 28th, who had no real place to go, the East River Street campground, that is to say the barbed wire uh, locked boneyard campground with fewer spaces that are, where tents are, sh are shoved cheek by jowl with each other and you can't leave freely. 
uh, is, not, is not in any way equivalent to the, uh, even replacing what the San Lorenzo campground provided. So if you're then gonna go after people with increased citations masquerading as a census, uh, or doing this inten more intensely than before, you're, you're re simply re reverting to the old policies. Um, I asked uh, Andy, who has been occasionally responsive to my questions, not always, and not recently really, but uh, a number of questions. We had a dialogue. Huge amounts of money have come from this council and prior councils and have gone into harassing the poor to the ordinances that you have created. Will the money you save uh, by cutting back on massive infraction enforcement of sleeping ban and nighttime park bans go into real social services? Or we hear more, oh, I wonder why the county isn't helping us with this kind of stuff as we usually do. Um, drug war money, the, the asset seizure money is being used by the police department, uh, Andy writes me. Why is that? I thought we're beyond this asset seizure stuff. You know, you can use all kinds of rhetoric. This is a lawful byproduct of criminal activity. There's nothing about that in this report. Um, how much money has been seized from folks accused of what crimes? What are the records here? Now, as of use of force, which was discussed here, and it's good to hear that people are in interested in knowing when are the police doing the chokeholds, the tasers, the drawing of the baton, the drawing of the weapon. These are important issues, but the public doesn't really get to know about this. I asked Andy for stats on this. He didn't give me specifics about when these things were done. And this is discretionary. The police department decides to keep these stats under wraps. So I don't see any of this changing either. Uh, what about the issues of, well, quality of life downtown? That means, of course, don't sit next to my business even if it's closed. If you're sitting uh, outside a closed store like Alpha Graphics and three individuals were doing in the rain about a week ago, you'll get forced out into the rain by police officers from Andy's police force. Or at least that was their account. And I don't necessarily discount it. We have the unconstitutional stay away laws. Will they continue to be enforced? And I see that I'm but out I, of time already. Do you want to finish your sentence? I need to finish more than that. You can just hand it out and we'll be happy to take a look at it. Next speaker. I may send it in to you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jane Becker. I have lived and worked in Santa Cruz for 35 years. What has struck me about what is going on with the Public Safety Committee and City Council is that no one seems to really be addressing what is the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is the fact that we have over a thousand homeless people in Santa Cruz, people that come with no money, no savings, no place to live, um, no job. And they come here to live on the streets. Many of them are doing drugs. Um, and as much as I feel for these people, the reality is that many of these people are stealing to support habits. They're breaking into cars. They're stealing bikes and shopping the parts. They are committing home burglaries. They are walking into businesses. I see this downtown quite a bit and taking what they want to take and leaving. What I'm going to suggest is that the city make a shift from anybody that wants to come here can come here to if you come here with no money, no job, no place to live, we will give you immediate food, um, attention to any immediate medical condition, and the next question is, how do we get you home? How do we get you bus fare? How do we get you airfare? There is no housing here for you, not realistically. There are very few jobs here. Santa Cruz is not a place just to come just to hang out because you're gonna be living on the streets. We need to have at a shift says, this is where we stop as a town. And then perhaps we will see the lessening of service calls to the police because we've eliminated a source, a causation of um, crime. Thank you. Thank you. Next, <clears throat> next speaker, please. I, um, thank you for the presentation. I, th I was uh, very informative, and I appreciate all your all the work that was was put into it. I have, I think, maybe four questions and maybe one observation. Um, I, uh, I and I don't you know much more than I, 
than I do, and maybe most of you do, but I know in some communities there's a um, non-emergency number is a 411 number that people can call, which seems like a very simple way, and that may not, not be possible here, I don't know, but that seems like that could be a possible easy fix to the, the police department getting, or um, 911 getting, having to field a lot more calls than they, than they are. So I guess I just have a question regarding that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's been any consideration, again, just cost and expense reduction and increased community policing in terms of having more police on bicycles. I, Santa Cruz, I've been here since the late 70s, and it, you know, probably like 15 years ago, it seemed like we did have a number of police on bikes, but that has, it doesn't seem like that's happening much. And I see poli police on ATVs and that type of thing, but that's not, you know, it's hard to talk to somebody when their ATV is running and they've got the helmet on and just the whole nine yards. Um, so that's just another question of mine. Um, uh, I know you were you said uh, uh, in your presentation that uh, I think you I don't know how many um, community um, forums you had in different parts of, of Santa Cruz. Um, I was curious if there was any um, community forum in Beach Flats. Whether there was, did you have? I just, I feel like I, I guess because you said as as part of that you said um, that each community um, sort of forum told you what the issue was, which is uh, theft, theft, theft. I guess my concern is is that isn't the whole community. Those are people who feel comfortable coming to a community forum with the police. There are people who don't feel comfortable with that. You know, that's, it's just, it's a problem. And I, you know that. <laughs> um, but I feel like um, if the only people you're speaking, responding to are the people that, that come to the forum, that's not the entire community. Um, Th thanks, Grant. Okay, I have one last thing to say. Um, to, yeah, wrap it up. Okay, I will, thank you. Um, and I noticed, and this is just a broader question, but I noticed that often when we have these things, there's, like at the moment, there's seven uh, uniformed officers here. I never know when, when that's going on. Are those, are those officers on pay right now? They're in uniform, so there's, and there's un, un-uniformed okay. officers and staff here from the police department, so I, that's another question. So <laughs> thank you, thank question. you, Grant. Thank you. Okay, um, is there any member of the public that would like to speak on this after the report um, prior to bringing it back to council? Okay, the, um, sir, you're, you're up next. Hi guys, my name is Gary Taylor. I've been living in Santa Cruz County for 30 Are you years. you speak into the mic, please? My name is Gary Taylor. I've been living in the county for about 30 years. Um, I got into an automobile accident about two years ago. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit of background. I was homeless in this city for about a year, almost a year and a half. So I know what it's like out there. I know exactly what it's like. I also, without any help, no one got out of it. I worked, it took a lot of hard work. I have some suggestions that you guys might be interested in, I don't really know. Um, I'm not familiar with the way the system works. Um, you might see me in the future here. I hope to see you do. Anyone that has any advice would love to talk to me. You could speak me. directly into Mike and Anyone face that wants us, to help me out or give me advice, you know, the, the procedures and policies, how things work, I'm totally open to that. Please do let me know. Um, <clears throat> now in the streets, there's a lot of violence going around, people stealing other people's things. I think that anyone, I'm a little nervous, excuse me. <laughs> anyone that has the motivation to get up and get a job and get themselves out of the situation, I think we should provide some resources so they can do that. You know, the easiest way is the, now look at the homeless population is all the same, but see the ones that got put there by a situation that are working to get out of it. And the ones that are just kind of idling, stealing, and you know, drug use. Um, I know that one issue I had, I lost multiple jobs over this was a place to put my things when I got up to go to work, where there would be when I could come back to have clothing, to have shelter, to have warmth, to have hygiene things. These are things you have to have to succeed. Other than that, you need communication, you must have. There's challenges there. Businesses don't want you in their business not spending any money in charging your phone. You can't even get your phone on. You could have 10 people calling you to give you a job, and you can't get on your phone. But they're people too. Where are they gonna charge their phone at? Where are they? You know. It's not, it's not a huge deal. Um, you know, one, one little idea I have, I'm just going to run it by you. I'm, I'm not very organized. Could, Shoot. You could just wrap it up. You say last sentence, please. Uh, yeah, the two ideas that they basically have is one of them is a, a day storage mm -hmm. where people that are motivated can come to store the things for the day so they can progress and get out of there and not be homeless anymore. Um, the other is uh, an outdoor, low-budget structure where qualified homeless can enter to live. And um, yeah. thank you, sir.
Thank you for your comments. I appreciate you being here. And if you want to put your name uh, and write down. You, I, I did look at okay, that thank you, sir. Next speaker. Yeah, thanks, Greg, for speaking. Um, and I'm sure you don't need to hear this, but many of the people living on the street were born and raised here or lived here for decades. And it's not actually statistically, according to a point in time survey uh, magnet for people living on the streets. And whenever I ask, offer a free bus ticket out of here, uh, the response is usually, I was born here. I don't need a free bus ticket home. Um, the thing that I found most interesting in the um, presentation was the uh, unusual drop in property crimes in 2008. And I think that highlights what our definition of property crimes, because we know that the um, that was the year of the most property crimes. But those property crimes were actually committed by Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America, where they stole literally dozens and dozens of people that I personally know um, their homes. And so uh, there is a direct correlation between the lack of enforcement against the theft of our community by bankers and and, and outside interests that come here and steal people's property, and the amount of people living on the streets. Because I know a lot of people who had a place to live, but the bank stole their landlord's house, and now they live outside. And you know many of those people too, and you probably are, are, are your friends. So I think the definition of crime is one of the issues that we uh, could face as a community. And um, there's a well-respected um, professor named Alex Vitale, who is uh, just, I just saw he gave a presentation about his book in, uh, in uh, Wales uh, about three days ago. And his book is called The End of Policing. And he has done uh, decades of research in changing the policing ideas and how it impacts the community. And I certainly encourage you to invite him to come here and speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the final speaker, unless someone else ste steps up. This is the final speaker, um, and we'll bring it back to council. Thank you, Mayor and council members and Chief Mills. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the, the ongoing work that you and your department have been doing to meet with a variety of community members and kind of, I see it as sort of coming out of some sort of a shell. So I'm wondering and hoping that this is gonna bring a lot of reassurance to the community. That, that you're accessible, that you're easy to talk to. Um, it felt, in my experience, that maybe the prior police department was meeting with a couple community groups and not a wide variety of people. Um, so, and, and something that you said, sort of uh, setting your department up to fail, it, it sort of resonated with me, is um, I, I'm wondering if referring to your officers as heroes um, and I have love for the Santa Cruz Police Department. My uncle was a police officer 100 years ago. But I think that that could possibly set up the community for disappointment because maybe they're also expecting that. And I personally like to have coffee with a real person. I want to I wanna have a beer with a police officer. I want to really relate to them on a one-on-one -on -one level. Um, and I don't want to have you feel like you have to be my rescuer, my hero. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's sort of a cultural uh, misunderstanding that could be um, addressed. Um, I really appreciate your addressing some of the complex issues that feed crime, like the economic disparity that we're experiencing, public health crises, climate, weather, freeway interchanges. It's all very complex. It's not as simple as um, we sometimes like to think. And um, lifting a, a, a variety of people up in the community that aren't in this room would do us all a lot better. And I really appreciate you mentioning that. And, um, and just in closing, I'd like to say that your, the website is amazing. There's so much more information for people that can't meet with you or can't come to a meeting. Um, I look forward to seeing stop data. I look forward to seeing more information from the Rangers. I look forward to seeing that the Rangers are getting some de-escalation training because they're um, dealing with, you know, a troubled uh, population that needs assistance. And I just want to thank you, and I want to thank all the officers here in this room that I find very accessible and easy to talk to. And let's continue to build relationships in the community and um, hopefully ease some of the balloon that you feel is, is sort of... Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This will be the final speaker unless the person in the back of the room standing wants to speak. This is the final speaker of the evening before it goes back to council. Good evening, I'm Damon Bruder, a uh, concerned citizen. Uh, thank you, Chief Mills, for being here. Um, I've heard through the grapevine, you know, the rumblings underground that your officers are upsetting people because your officers are starting to do their job. 
Um, these are law-abiding people, or generally law-abiding people that have gotten tickets for various things. Um, yay, I'm glad. Uh, if I deserve a ticket, write one to me. If anybody deserves a ticket, write one. Catch and release, I know that's the situation right now. Your hands are tied. Please keep catching. Um, as far as the release part, well, that's up to the laws that govern the judges. There is an initiative going around right now, the Keep California Safe initiative. It closes the loopholes in Prop 47 and 57 to help you do your job. Uh, if you want to sign that petition or hear about it, see my wife after the meeting. Um, and I do want to applaud the Rangers and the SCPD for the way that they handle situations that could quickly escalate. I saw a situation on Pacific Avenue last week where a Ranger uh, talked to a gentleman and actually ended up getting him at that moment a bus ticket home to San Francisco to get out of here because that's what he wanted, even though the person was <clears throat> fun to deal with. Uh, the Rangers, uh, uh, they handled it very professionally and very patiently. And uh, you know that's what I see when I see the Rangers and I see the SPD, SCPD. When they deal with people like that, they deal with them compassionately, professionally, and patiently. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. I'll bring it back to council. I know there was someone who mentioned the issue of the charging um, and storage and he's left. And so those of you, either uh, Cynthia or Rochelle, who are on the um, public or the homeless, um, uh, homeless coordinating, coordinating committee. committee can email him and talk about what that work's done. I'd appreciate it. Um, and I, I think I'd, I'd just like to say, you know, this is an opportunity for comments, but also questions if there are still that come after the public speakers. I want to um, say that this is the first time we've ever had a comprehensive report since I've been on council that went into the staffing and organizational issues that, you know, that I feel are just essential to say how we can move forward. I mean, we have what I feel is a, a public safety kind of crisis when you look at the statistics that we've seen over the past 10 years. Um, the report that you showed us goes up through 2015, but it looks like we've had just a, uh, a consistently high level of crime that's existed in this town. And we cannot just continue to tolerate the way things have been. It's got to change. And so by having a restructured department that looks at how we manage those, I think is essential for our city's future. One of the things that I really want to speak to is the fact that how we're measuring what constitutes safety in this town also has to change. If we're taking information that comes through where we're treating all crimes the same way, you know, everything becomes, you know, an urgency. And I, I know you're speaking to that in your, in your comments, but when this uh, consolidation of all the 911 um, non-emergency and emergency calls took place, it was about in 2007, and it was a, a means to track that. And the number you shared is the one that's kind of more of the emergency level is kind of consistent what it was at the time that they merged them then. And so when we look at whether or not officers are responding at this time, it seems as though we're kind of at that same place and there's been kind of a static. So I, I want to just make sure that one, when we look forward, that we're measuring how we are going to be making improvements. And if it's by neighborhood, then I think we should be looking at the types of um, reporting that comes back to us, not the reports that we've seen recently, but what are the types of crimes that are taking place in the Beach Flats area or the downtown or in the Upper West Side or East Side so that we're seeing where we can go from there? Because they're not, um, right now, they're, I don't know how we as a city can um, say to invest more um, will we get that result? If it's not a monetary thing, in my mind, I think there's some other policy issues at play that we need to really focus on. And I, I read the report thoroughly and I thought that um, their comments that they had about um, having the, the police department advocate with the electeds on where those are was for me like a, a critical thing. And I don't think we hear enough as far as, well, what are those barriers that we, can, that we have that go beyond our staffing levels that we need to focus on as a city? Um, those are just some initial comments, but I'd love to hear from the council as far as, you know, how we can better prioritize these safety issues that, um, you know, that are outlined in the report as well as kind of the, the ultimate staffing recommendations that are included. Councilmember Member Crone. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to first run through really quickly, and I know you're a big guy because we've talked about these questions. I, I no, noticed five questions came up from the public. Police on bikes. Oh, we have them. And uh, in fact, uh, Brandon Lima, you still here? How many miles you put it in a week? <laughs> oh, come on, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, reaching out to Beach Flats residents. There was no forum. I know one of them, I guess, was included in the, uh, uh, was it Bayview? No, it was Galt School, both of them. But how do we reach out to Beach Flats residents? Well, we frequently are down there on foot talking with residents. Uh, Leo, we have several Spanish speakers who go door to door down there on a regular basis and work with people. Uh, we, we did not break it down to every uh, single small neighborhood in the city. There had just been way too many meetings. Um, it was a push as it was. So uh, they were included in uh, several of those meeting areas. Uh, Seven uniformed officers here tonight. Are they all on duty? Uh, most of them are because I've asked my uh, deputy chiefs and my lieutenants to be here as uh, managers who are representing their service areas in case you had questions for them. Uh, so yeah, they're, most of them are on duty. And the, the, just to respond to the hero's comment? They are heroes. Okay, we'll leave it at that. And, um, and But they can't drink beer on duty. <laughs> and maybe this is, uh, I know that the city manager and I talked about this. Uh, uh, two questions came up, a non-emergency number and um, the bus ticket home and how do we get people home? Uh, with respect to the non-emergency number, um, there is a, there is one that the NETCOM uh, has in place, and I think part of the change might be to, I think before the rationale was it goes to the same place. Uh, but however, the distinction here, though, is the response needs to be different, so it, it does matter. So I think we'll, we'll start work with NETCOM to make that change. The other thing that I've mentioned to you, too, that we're working on is we are looking at implementing a uh, 3 311 system, uh, an app where people can, uh, with their phones, you know, uh, submit complaints. And so that's uh, gearing up here to get going pretty soon. So hopefully by the fall, we should have that up and, and running to make it easier for people to report crimes. And related to that too is uh, as we look at this data and we look at alternatives to uh, responding to calls, I think working with all the other city staff, we can, for example, there are areas where it makes more sense to have, you know, public works, for example, respond to certain calls uh, of a certain variety. We'll, 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 we'll make that change uh, as appropriate. So we'll be looking at all of that. And the bus ticket home? Oh, we do have a homeward bound program uh, that uh, an individual alluded to that uh, is offered to individuals. Uh, and actually we do make quite, quite a use of that. Uh, we actually expanded the budget for that. So people do regularly uh, choose to, to go home um, uh, through that program. And the last question for chief is uh, the ticketing of uh, homeless campers. Is that continuing? Is it, is it any different than before well, my, the bench yeah. lands took place? No, my policy still stands from midnight at night to six in the morning. If people are sleeping, we don't issue them a ticket when there's not a complaint. And uh, if there is a complaint, then we take care of business. But during the daytime, uh, it's still legal to, uh, to camp. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council Member Chase. Yeah, I, I just really appreciated the approach that the report took basically talking about realigning resources and I think that's really smart looking at what we have and utilizing it better. The way I describe it to people often is the putting the right response to the right situation at the right time. And I think referencing actually the conversation with Chief Frawley is really important too, is how much time officers are going out to respond to public health issues when it's really a public health response that's needed. And I think that's a huge part of what we see in this community and was referenced many times tonight, whether it be really relating to homelessness or substance abuse or behavioral health, those are really public health issues. Um, and so I just appreciate the approach you're taking and I'm looking forward to see what it does to realign the resources that you have now and, and continue to encourage um, every possible creative way to get more staff and know that I think council has consistently been behind that, doing whatever we can to support that. Absolutely, you have been. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins. Thank you for your presentation tonight and for all the folks that are here in the audience. Um, I. I just want to say um, how much respect I have for the work that you do in our community and having worked alongside a number of the officers in my other capacity in education, I know how dedicated um, you are to our community and, and um, we feel that and we know it. I, I really want to say how much I appreciate that this report is data driven and is looking at how our systems are um, functioning and how they can improve and I think systems change is, is challenging and it takes time and I um, but I, I believe it's necessary. And I think you know, law enforcement and criminalization and um, there's a place for that and also a, a bigger sort of picture of the health and well-being of our community and the health and well-being of your officers are tied to that. I think, um, bless you, Thank one you. of the components that I just really appreciate you bringing up and what I feel really passionate about is prevention. I think we foster what we feed and if we feed more preventative activities and preventative strategies, then we will see results. And and so I'm really um, all for that and supportive of that. 
I um, believe that this is a bigger community conversation, and I really look forward to more um, partnerships and collaborations, community strategies, diversions, neighborhood accountability boards, whatever it may be, to start saying how is we, how can we as a community uh, rise up to be supportive of the health and well-being of all of our community, and and that and then um, results in less criminal activity off, often. I, I am um, I'm interested in workforce development, and I know I've mentioned to, that to you also. I think we can build our own, and I think there's a lot of um, beauty in that and the connections and ties to the local community, and then also just the sort of um, logistics of how expensive it is to live in this community. And so if we can work on workforce development and trying to recruit and engage and um, create that, that pipeline, that would be fantastic in a consideration for secession planning. Um, and then just, you know, just really the alignment of resources, I think, is a really incredible takeaway. I think when we know um, information, we have to do something about that. And what the takeaway in terms of how to more proactively look at what we have and how to best utilize that um, is incredibly important. So I, I have, you know, a number of observations as somebody who really appreciates criminal justice and, and public safety and health and well-being of our community. Um, but I'll leave it at that and um, just really thank you for the work. And I look forward to periodically hearing updates on where we are so we can measure our success and, and sort of check in and see where we can go in the right direction from there. Councilmember Noroyan. Uh, I know in your goal of getting more officers um, uh, out on patrol that you're looking at some changes and um, when Vice Mayor Watkins mentioned the prevention side of things, which I believe we're all very passionate about. Um, I know that you do, uh, you know, we have the Citizens Police Academy, which is an education component um, of the community and something I went through several years ago. And I just find invaluable in terms of bringing that here as a council member. And also the Pride program, which gets involved with at-risk youth that are at the mission or junior high, uh, oh, junior high, just dated myself, middle school age level. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, will those um, programs still exist and um, if so, how, if most of the officers are gonna be out in the field? Well, the person running those programs was Leo Gomez, who everybody just you know raves about, and I, do, I rave about him as well. I've redeployed him to the field. However, today I met with a group of volunteers and uh, to try to transfer the, uh, much of the responsibility to a cadre of volunteers who can run these same programs with the help and the assistance of sworn uh, personnel. Now, that's a huge lift to ask of volunteers. This is a, a, a very robust program, um, a lot of time commitment. So what we're probably going to do is continue these programs as much as we can, tailoring them back just a little bit uh, so that we can uh, continue with the programs, however, um, move it forward. Uh, Council uh, Vice Mayor Watkins uh, gave me a grant the other day uh, to deal with tobacco. And so we see this as a way to work with um, the Pride program. And so I've got a person writing that grant. It's due, I think, at the end of this week. So we're pushing a, a deadline. And uh, we think we might be able to bring that person on should we be successful in that grant application to run the program completely. So we're, we're trying to find ways to, uh, to push forward, continue these programs. We see them as hugely beneficial to, uh, to the department, to the city. Uh, I'm not interested in backing away from those. Uh, we just, we're just going to have to figure out what's a reasonable balance uh, because I, I, I need every boot on the ground right now uh, to deal with the crime issues. All right. And I know what's great. I know with the Pride program because I'm um, involved with this with my uh, other hat on. Right. Um, our interns want to continue. Our, our UC Santa Cruz interns who work with Pride definitely want to continue helping. So look to that as a resource as well. And maybe there's an opportunity to step it up um, from that end as well. Great, thank you. That's yeah. Brown. I would just echo the comments from my colleagues about um, the tremendous respect that uh, I also have uh, for the work that you all do, understanding it's very difficult. I mean, I guess I would just highlight my appreciation for a couple of the um, the ways that you've talked this evening and have been um, engaging with the public around this question of um, one, police officers being kind of tasked with the job of social services within our city and the challenges and the frustrations that I imagine uh, officers face. I mean, we, I really appreciate the data-driven, you know, the report, but it, it doesn't necessarily give you the 
picture of what people experience on the ground. And so I think it's really important for all of us to stay in touch with that. And um, I'll be talking with you about ride alongs in the very near future. Sure. I haven't done one in quite a while. But, you know, I think that, so I think just, you know, uh, really pay, being mindful of that, and I, I appreciate that you are, and that you really are supporting a team of officers and, and personnel who have the best interests of our city at heart, and also your your position on uh, enforcement of the the camp, our camping ordinance, our sleeping ban, and um, I hope that that has taken some of the pressure off of officers. Um, but I'm not, you know, I don't really know. So if you want to say anything about that now. That would be great, but otherwise we can talk about that um, in the future. So thank you for, for everything you're doing, and I'm really excited. I think a lot of people in the community are excited. I know at my neighborhood meeting uh, at Galt School, you know, I saw people who live on my street who are, you know, were really inspired and want to get involved in community policing in a way and feel really, um, uh, they feel that the police department is becoming more accessible. And um, so I just appreciate that. and. Thank you to um, our deputy chiefs who are here as well. I know you're committed to that too. Thanks. You know, I just would follow up on something that was included in the report. There was a recommendation that the consultants made about um, considering the establishment of a, a dedicated team that dealt with the social services issues that are really being handled by the police department. I know we've seen in the city of San Jose where they have groups that are assembled to deal with some of the issues that come up so that are signed um, directly and they're budgeted. Um, we, as part of our work plan, have set up a group that's, um, you know, one tasked with issues of homelessness and others. Have you thought about why that wasn't in their recommendation, the final recommendation, to, to have that type of um, group assigned to deal with this so that we are kind of furthering mm -hmm. that realignment to you know, have um, maybe non-officers handle those types of tasks? Well, I think that is an, an important uh, uh, issue to look at. And one of the things I'm, I think I'm really proud of, of the city is that uh, our uh, neighborhood services team and uh, the entire city is kind of unified in dealing with these problems together. And, uh, and I, it's one group of people all pushing the same direction, and, I, and that's so important for us to be successful that way. I, you know, we have, as you know, um, mental health liaisons who, who ride with our officers in the cars mm -hmm. and from the county, and they do a great job dealing with some of these bigger uh, mental health issues. But I would be very in favor of a team uh, that is a countywide uh, team to the, uh, that assesses this, that works with city employees as well as county employees, mostly county employees. This is their responsibility. I just don't think that should be a police responsibility. We have to dig ourselves out of this problem rather than get further entrenched. And now having said that, we're the only game in town right now. And, um, and that's, that becomes kind of tough until, uh, let's say we, the city, um, is the only game in town. Well, I mean, I'll just say we have uh, funded um, programs to kind of address that in a comprehensive way, and we do have some council members on various committees that kind of are looking at those. I would like maybe our public safety committee to look at that very issue about how we can kind of continue to shift some of those responsibilities to non, you know, PD assignments so that they can be freed up even further. Sure. We did that earlier in the year with um, some of the public works and doing traffic enforcement. I don't know if that's still continuing, like in terms of the uh, parking um, in different parts of the city. And I think there's opportunities for other areas to deal with that and other kind of programs that maybe could be peeled off to further free up officers. And I'd like to hear from, you know, the PD and city manager's office on where those might, you know, be. The other thing is I feel like there should be, you know, realignment with results. That's important that we say that, you know, hey, we are doing this and there's a reason why we're moving forward is to, to see a positive change. And you outlined a five-year kind of period of time that you see these re results taking place. I think it would be good to, to at least indicate what kind of expectations the community would be seeing in each of those periods over time. So we know exactly, you know, the direction we're going and we can have the opportunity to comment on it. But, you know, the realignments with results, I think is a strategy to make our community safer. And I like the idea of making sure that we're identifying where in our neighborhoods we're able to prioritize to make our, our city safer. Agreed. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm having my lieutenants do is meet with the deputy chiefs and myself monthly to give us an update on what they're doing, what their priorities are in their in their neighbor policing areas and, and how we're doing uh, in terms of the data associated with that. Now, creating that data at this point is a little bit rough, I have to be honest, because mm -hmm. of the RMS system. However, 
we're going to do the best we can and move forward. I would hope that community members would start to see relief and, uh, and it shouldn't take you know, five years to see that kind of relief. We need, to, we need to, you know, as I said before, listening time is over, now it's time to get at it and we're getting at it. And just one final comment and that is, I know um, Carol Skurich from Parks and Recs is here. Um, we, it would be good if the uh, Parks and Rec Commission were able to hear the recommendations on the, the Ranger issues that came up. We got an email on that. I'd like to make sure that's rolled out. Uh, um, I, I haven't heard any feedback from the parks, but I mean, I, I think the, the program's been very successful in terms of prioritizing some of the uh, park safety issues and, and keeping them well maintained in, uh, in parts of the city. And I think having something that's reorganized might even kind of expand it to new parks and other areas. So it'd be good to get their feedback on what this proposal means to the parks department from one of our subcommittees as well. So I hope you'll plan to do that. Sure. Councilmember Crone. <laughs> Three quick issues that are kind of leftovers that have <clears throat> um, been part of our community discussions, and then a couple comments. But um, HSI, are they have a desk no longer at the police department, and what's our relationship there? Homeland um, Security Investigations. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, who no, I was, <laughs> okay, for the for the public, um, they do not have a desk in the police department. Uh, they are completing. A, uh, a, that large case where you would hopefully will see indictments in the near future. Um, but there's no activity in terms of immigration enforcement, period. Okay. And exclamation point uh, from the uh, Santa Cruz uh, Police Department. Thank you. And ICE, what's our relationship right now with them? Well, it's kind of ICE's division of HSI. And um, we, there's the relationship is if you have information that we need, you know, intelligence on terrorism or something, we'll take it, but we're not working with them. And crisis intervention training, there was a goal to get all the officers uh, trained. Is, has that been realized? It has. Uh, we gave uh, uh, de-escalation training to our entire department, had members of the community come and watch it uh, to make sure that it was something that was in line with what their thinking was, and it was uh, successful. And I think we can chalk up a, a say from the other day just with that. Okay, I just want to say that um, I really appreciate all of your efforts, um, that what you've been doing, reaching out. The first day when I met you, going to um, Cafe Pergolesi for a coffee, you know, and just your you jumping in my leaf and taking a tour of uh, places around Santa Cruz. Um, I want to say thank you to the deputy chiefs too. I saw those, I was at three of those meetings um, recently. I thought you, uh, 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 Lieutenant Garcia as well, I thought you guys did a stellar job um, reaching out to people. And I think that's what it really is about. It's that, that contact people want a, a voice. We don't have the, all the answers, and, and, uh, and we're looking to the public for some answers. But I really thought you you all did a, a just a, a bang up job at, at those meetings. You stayed for a while after every for every question to be answered as people left and stuff. Um, this report, I'm I, I read a lot of reports, and this is a, a better report, and it's it's much more professional, but it's also um, sort of in your face. It's, it's pointing out the warts as well as what you do well. So, you know, a lot of reports are written for people who pay <laughs> for the report to be written. And there's a little bit of that in here, but there's also some criticism and some like, hey, um, you know, this is how to do better. And I, and I really appreciate seeing that in, in, in print as well. Um, lastly, what, just to underline what Councilmember Watkins said about public health issues, really important that, you know, we pursue that, that, that line of, you know, uh, with the public and not everything's not a police intervention. It's a, there's a lot of public health interventions going on and we need to like, you know, make that happen. And I really appreciate teaming up with Chief Frawley and, and anybody at the county too who wants to be part of that uh, to address those issues. So thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Okay. Do you have any comments? No. Okay. There's um, action that's on the floor that we need. So can I get a motion? Sure. I'll move that we accept the recommendation as written in the report. Second. Uh, Vice, Ma <laughs> Vice Mayor Watkins, um, I'll do the chair of the Public Safety Committee, uh, the Council Member Noroyan. So that's a uh, motion and a second. And also I hope that we have a referral kind of to the Public Safety Committee to go into more detail in terms of some of the discussion points that we had today. And um, also um, kind of continue to follow up on this. I appreciate um, the, the, not only the format of the presentation, but the reporting as 
Council Member Crone mentioned that was provided, and I could see how this would be beneficial in other parts of the city to see stuff like this to know, hey, how we can move the the um, move the needle on um, our public safety needs in, in the city. So thank you. Okay, there's a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. That passes unanimously. Have a good evening. The meeting is adjourned. Yeah, right. I'm gonna get the chief first.